Miren, eh, mi mano, el guante, está súper limpio. Ahí lo tienen. Ustedes vieron el agua limpia. Después de un poco de este, verle movido el sedimento. Vea. Puro petróleo. Deep within the lungs of the world, the Amazon rainforest, a disaster of unprecedented magnitude is taking place. Those responsible are determined to keep it a secret. Little has changed for residents of the Ecuadorian Amazon over the past centuries. The indigenous tribes live the same way their forefathers did, in harmony with nature. The rainforest provides everything one could need. Water, food, and shelter. However, in the early 1960s, development came to their doorstep. Besides being abundant with wildlife, the Amazon was also rich in oil. This caught the attention of one of the largest oil producing companies in the world, Texaco. In the following three decades, the once pristine rainforest was transformed into what has been described as one of the world's most contaminated industrial sites, the Amazon's Chernobyl. Oil waste has polluted everything from land to water to air. To this day, tribes living in the area are condemned to eat, drink, and breathe the poison Texaco had left behind. For 18 years, affected communities fought the oil giant in a fierce legal battle that ended differently than you'd expect. The story began in 1964 when the first oil exploration operations started in northeast Ecuador. By that time, the United States' oil consumption largely overpassed domestic production, and the Americans had to resort to looking abroad. The U.S.-based oil company Texaco organized the exploration, which resulted in striking oil in 1967. The full-scale production began five years later. In return for giving the concession, Ecuador's government received a 25% stake in the consortium. Over the years, the shares increased the operations were run exclusively by Texaco staff. Founded in 1902, Texaco was one of the so-called Seven Sisters, companies that dominated the global petroleum industry in post-World War II era. They had tremendous experience in the business and in oil production technology. Moreover, Texaco was one of the pioneers in creating advanced environmental protection technologies as required by the high pollution standards in the United States of America. Drilling for oil was impossible without following the procedure to protect the environment adequately. When creating an oil well in the United States, engineers would dig a temporary pit in the ground to store oil waste. Pits would be lined with a special impermeable industrial tarp to ensure no waste leaks into the ground. There was also a separation station where the crude oil was refined from its toxic residue, also known as produced water. This was pumped back into the underground pockets from which the oil was initially extracted. When the drilling was completed, the well and separation station were removed. Temporary pits were emptied and the oil sludge was disposed of into special containers. Then the pit would be refilled with dirt and the location would return to its original state. This was not the case in Ecuador. Instead, the Texaco management estimated that the reinjection of produced water and removal of oil waste from temporary pits were unnecessary expenses. So rather than pumping the produced water back into the ground, they decided to drain it straight into nearby rivers and streams. Oil sludge was poured into temporary pits without protective tarp liners. That allowed the toxic waste to seep into the ground and underground water systems that local inhabitants used for drinking. Over many years of drilling operations, the temporary pits were transformed into permanent ones. They had overflow pipes installed to transport the sludge into rivers and streams. Additionally, Texaco engineers burned off the toxic natural gas during the oil extraction, thus releasing enormous amounts of highly poisonous dioxins into the air. During the 28 years when Texaco was mining oil in the area, they dumped more than 18.5 billion gallons of toxic produced water 
into the rainforest. The waste was spilled on an area of 1,500 square miles, roughly the size of the state of Rhode Island. In fact, no plans were ever developed to clear the pits. The company kept all its records of environmental incidents in Ecuador, such as oil leaks and waste spills, under wraps. The consequences of the contaminated soil, groundwater, and surface waterways deeply affected the lives of tens of thousands of residents. Aquí muchos niños sufren consecuencias, respiraciones, sarpullidos. Aquí en este lugar de la primavera, algunas gentes han, han muerto con cáncer. Por decir el, el papá mío, uno, mi mamá hace, hace unos dos años murió con cáncer. Es que imagínese usted, uno, a tomar agua de los esteros. Laboratory results showed that soil and water samples near Texaco's oil wells contained high quantities of total petroleum hydrocarbons, a highly cancerous mixture of chemical compounds originating from crude oil. The amounts were up to 1,000 times larger than allowed by Ecuadorian law, and even 10,000 times larger than the limits prescribed by the U.S. law. Livestock were dying due to the drinking from contaminated rivers and streams. Fishing was made impossible because toxins in the waterways killed all the fish. In the region which flourished with biodiversity, pollution decimated the wildlife. The most affected were the people who lived in the provinces of Sucumbios, Oriana, Napo, and Pastaza. Exposure to high amounts of TPH caused them to suffer from damaged internal organs, respiratory problems, blood poisoning, stomach and skin irritation, and birth defects. In addition, several scientific studies have reported increased rates of cancer, children's leukemia, and miscarriages in these provinces, much higher than in other parts of Ecuador. For the sake of profit, Texaco generated one of the worst environmental disasters in recent history. Their savings were estimated at slightly over $3 per barrel. In 1992, Texaco's concession on oil drilling operations in Ecuador ended, leaving the government-owned PetroEcuador as the business's sole owner. Unfortunately, the waste they left behind continued killing the people. To end their misery, the following year, 30,000 locals organized themselves into the Amazon Defense Front, or FDA. The group worked with American-based attorney Stephen Donzinger to file a class-action lawsuit against Texaco in the United States. The FDA demanded the company repair the damage it caused to the environment and financially compensate the affected communities. However, they also wanted to make sure the world heard about the tragedy. Thus, in 1993, Donzinger and the FDA's legal team filed a class action lawsuit against Texaco in New York Federal Court. To people from the Ecuadorian Amazon, getting justice was a matter of life or death. But the same was true for Texaco. If the FDA had won the trial, it would have been a precedent for other cases worldwide where the oil company had been accused of destroying the environment. A battle between David and Goliath began instead, often outside the bounds of the legal system. While the FDA activists gathered piles of evidence showing the extent of the crime committed in the Amazon rainforest, Texaco management developed a different strategy. They organized a lobbying campaign to move the trial from the United States to Ecuador, since winning abroad was expected to be much easier than facing an American jury. Texaco's lawyers and experts filed 14 sworn affidavits praising the justices and fairness of the Ecuadorian courts. The case, they claimed, belonged to Ecuador. In October 2000, Texaco was acquired by another oil giant, Chevron. The new management admitted Texaco dumped produced water into Amazon waterways, but paradoxically continued defending that cleaning the area was not their responsibility. Chevron's attorneys claimed the company had done its part in repairing the damage and that the rest of the duty was on the Ecuadorian government. However, the company's $40 million cleaning campaign was nothing more than a cosmetic treatment. In reality, they only took responsibility for a small number of pits, and these were just covered with dirt without removing the toxic oil sludge. 
While Chevron's workers were hiding the traces of their misdeed, its lawyers and lobbyists continued campaigning to move the trial to Ecuador. Finally, after years of lobbying, the money invested paid off. In 2002, the federal court in New York approved the transfer of the trial to Ecuador. Chevron promised to oblige all of the decisions of its courts. But the oil company was in for a surprise. The Ecuadorian court was indeed fair-minded and impartial, leading the process meticulously and taking into account the interests of both parties. The trial records accounted to 220,000 pages, but the crucial evidence were 54 court-supervised inspections of Texaco's former oil wells. It was during these inspections that a shocking amount of TPH was found in the water and soil. Prior to this, Chevron's engineers secretly surveyed the oil wells to find areas in the ground with as little TPH as possible. Nice job, Dave. You one simple task. Who, who picked don't, the spot, Renee? Don't find who picked the spot, Renee. <laughs> However, the pollution was so widespread that they could not find any clean samples to present as evidence of Chevron's cleanup. Eighteen years since the original lawsuit was filed, and nine years after the trial was moved to Ecuador, the court finally reached a verdict. Chevron was found guilty of polluting two million acres of the Amazonian rainforest. The court ordered them to pay $18 billion for the remediation of the environment the restoration of ecology, and to compensate the five affected indigenous communities. Half of the sum was the fine for Chevron refusing to publicly apologize. However, after an appeals court ruled there was no legal basis to sanction Chevron for not apologizing, the fine was reduced to $9.5 billion. The verdict was the end of a long-lasting struggle to hold the reckless oil company accountable. Justice was achieved. It was not how Chevron saw things, though. Much to the public's dismay, Chevron refused to pay any fine altogether. Instead, they responded to the verdict with a fierce campaign against enforcing it. Intending to dismiss the validity of the Ecuadorian court judgment, they filed a countersuit in the United States Federal Court and the Hague's Permanent Court of Arbitration. The countersuit based on the testimony of an Ecuadorian ex-judge, Alberto Guerra, who claimed local tribes offered him money to ghostwrite the Ecuadorian court judgment. In 2014, the U.S. District Court in New York ruled that the Ecuadorian verdict was the product of fraud and racketeering, and thus unenforceable. This released Chevron from liability for damage it caused in Ecuador, and the Hague Court ruled the same verdict ordering the Ecuadorian government to pay $112 million to Chevron. The two verdicts meant there was no way to enforce the Ecuadorian ruling. FDA lawyer Stephen Donzinger was ultimately put on house arrest for refusing to provide the court with his personal computer, phone, and all the documents relating to the lawsuit. It appears the victim has become the culprit. One year after the federal court verdict, the key witness in the case, Alberto Guerra, disavowed most of his testimony. This came after FDA activists discovered a series of contracts he had signed with Chevron for various perks worth at least $326,000. Nevertheless, the federal court verdict based on his testimony remained in effect. Chevron publicly promised that, we're going to fight this until hell freezes over, and then will fight it out on the ice, and it became clear to the indigenous tribes that there was little hope of victory. Chevron never paid a cent of compensation, nor had it done anything to repair the damage it caused. Instead, they withdrew all of their assets from Ecuador and left the country for good. In its place, the sentence fell on the indigenous tribes of the Ecuadorian Amazon. They are condemned to drink, eat, and breathe toxic waste for the rest of their lives. I'd like to thank Chris Dan Han for sharing material from Ecuador, Poisoned Rainforest to be used in today's episode. There's a link to the full documentary in the description. Watch this episode next if you found this video interesting. Please add a like and leave a comment if you want to support the channel.